part two recent progress of astronomy chapter one of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century chapter one foundation of astronomical physics part one in the year eighteen twenty six heinrich schwab of dessau elated with the hope of speedily delivering himself from the hereditary incubus of an apothecary's shop obtained from munich a small telescope and began to observe the sun his choice of an object for his researches was instigated by his friend harding of Göttingen. it was a peculiarly happy one the changes visible in the solar surface were then generally regarded as no less capricious than the changes in the skies of our temperate regions consequently the reckoning and registering of sun-spots was a task hardly more inviting to an astronomer than the reckoning and registering of summer clouds cassini kyle lemonnier lalande were unanimous in declaring that no trace of regularity could be detected in their appearances or effacements delambre pronounced them more curious than really useful even herschel profoundly as he studied them and intimately as he was convinced of their importance as symptoms of solar activity saw no reason to suspect that their abundance and scarcity were subject to orderly alternation one man alone in the eighteenth century christian horbau of copenhagen divined their periodical character and foresaw the time when the effects of the sun's vicissitudes upon the globes revolving round him might be investigated with success but this prophetic utterance was of the nature of a soliloquy rather than of a communication and remained hidden away in an unpublished journal until eighteen fifty nine when it was brought to light in a general ransacking of archives indeed schwab himself was far from anticipating the discovery which fell to his share he compared his fortune to that of saul who seeking his father's asses found a kingdom for the hope which inspired his early resolution lay in quite another direction his patient ambush was laid for a possible intramercurial planet which he thought must sooner or later betray its existence in crossing the face of the sun he took however the most effectual measures to secure whatever new knowledge might be accessible during forty-three years his imperturbable telescope never failed weather and health permitting to bring in its daily report as to how many or if any spots were visible on the sun's disk the information obtained being day by day recorded on a simple and unvarying system in eighteen forty three he made his first announcement of a probable decennial period but it met with no general attention although julius schmidt of bonn afterwards director of the athens observatory and gautier of geneva were impressed with his figures and Littreau had himself in eighteen thirty six hinted at the likelihood of some kind of regular recurrence schwab however worked on gathering each year fresh evidence of a law such as he had indicated and when humboldt published in eighteen fifty one in the third volume of his cosmos a table of the sun-spot statistics collected by him from eighteen twenty six downwards the strength of his case was perceived with so to speak a start of surprise the reality and importance of the discovery were simultaneously recognized and the persevering hofrath of dessau found himself famous among astronomers his merit recognized by the bestowal of the astronomical society's gold medal in eighteen fifty seven consisted in his choice of an original and appropriate line of work and in the admirable tenacity of purpose with which he pursued it his resources and acquirements were those of an ordinary amateur he was distinguished solely by the unfortunately rare power of turning both to the best account 
he died where he was born and had lived april eleventh eighteen seventy five at the ripe age of eighty six meanwhile an investigation of a totally different character and conducted by totally different means had been prosecuted to a very similar conclusion two years after schwab began his solitary observations humboldt gave the first impulse at the scientific congress of berlin in eighteen twenty eight to a great international movement for attacking simultaneously in various parts of the globe the complex problem of terrestrial magnetism through the genius and energy of gauss gottingen became its centre thence new apparatus and a new system for its employment issued there in eighteen thirty three the first regular magnetic observatory was founded whilst at Göttingen was fixed the universal time standard for magnetic observations a letter addressed by humboldt in april eighteen thirty six to the duke of sussex as president of the royal society enlisted the cooperation of england a network of magnetic stations was spread all over the british dominions from canada to van diemen's land measures were concerted with foreign authorities and an expedition was fitted out under the able command of captain afterwards sir james clark ross for the special purpose of bringing intelligence on the subject from the dismal neighbourhood of the south pole in eighteen forty one the elaborate organization created by the disinterested efforts of scientific agitators was complete gauss's magnetometers were vibrating under the view of attentive observers in five continents and simultaneous results began to be recorded ten years later in september eighteen fifty one dr john lamont the scotch director of the munich observatory in reviewing the magnetic observations made at Göttingen and munich from eighteen thirty five to eighteen fifty perceived with some surprise that they gave unmistakable indications of a period which he estimated at ten and a third years the manner in which this periodicity manifested itself requires a word of explanation the observations in question referred to what is called the declination of the magnetic needle that is to the position assumed by it with reference to the points of the compass when moving freely in a horizontal plane now this position as was discovered by graham in seventeen twenty two is subject to a small daily fluctuation attaining its maximum towards the east about eight a m and its maximum towards the west shortly before two p m in other words the direction of the needle approaches in these countries at the present time nearest to the true north some four hours before noon and departs farthest from it between one and two hours after noon it was the range of this daily variation that lamont found to increase and diminish once in every ten and one-third years in the following winter sir edward sabine ignorant as yet of lamont's conclusions undertook to examine a totally different set of observations the materials in his hands had been collected at the british colonial stations of toronto and hobarton from eighteen forty three to eighteen forty eight and had reference not to the regular diurnal swing of the needle but to those curious spasmodic vibrations the inquiry into the laws of which was the primary object of the vast organization set on foot by humboldt and gauss yet the upshot was practically the same once in about ten years magnetic disturbances termed by humboldt storms were perceived to reach a maximum of violence and frequency sabine was the first to note the coincidence between this unlooked-for result and schwab's sunspot period he showed that so far as observation had yet gone the two cycles of change agreed perfectly both in duration and phase maximum corresponding to maximum minimum to minimum what the nature of the connection could be that bound together by a common law effects so dissimilar as the rents in the luminous garment of the sun and the swayings to and fro of the magnetic needle was and still remains beyond the reach of well-founded theory but the fact was from the first undeniable the memoir containing this remarkable disclosure was presented to the royal society march eighteen and read may sixth eighteen fifty two 
on the thirty first of july following rudolph wolf at berne and on the eighteenth of august alfred gautier at sion announced separately and independently perfectly similar conclusions this triple event is perhaps the most striking instance of the successful employment of the baconian method of co-operation and discovery by which particulars are amassed by one set of investigators corresponding to the depredators and inoculators of solomon's house while inductions are drawn from them by another and a higher class the interpreters of nature yet even here the convergence of two distinct lines of research was wholly fortuitous and skilful combination owed the most brilliant part of its success to the unsought bounty of what we call fortune the exactness of the coincidence thus brought to light was fully confirmed by further inquiries a diligent search through the scattered records of sun-spot observations from the time of galileo and shiner onwards put wolf in possession of materials by which he was enabled to correct schwab's loosely indicated decennial period to one of slightly over eleven eleven point eleven years and he further showed that this fell in with the ebb and flow of magnetic change even better than le mans ten and a third year cycle the analogy was also pointed out between the light curve or zigzag line representing on paper the varying intensity in the lustre of certain stars and the similar delineation of spot frequency the ascent from minimum to maximum being in both cases usually steeper than the descent from maximum to minimum while an additional point of resemblance was furnished by the irregularities in height of the various maxima in other words both the number of spots on the sun and the brightness of variable stars increase as a rule more rapidly than they decrease nor does the amount of that increase in either instance show any approach to uniformity the endeavour suggested by the very nature of the phenomenon to connect sun-spots with weather was less successful the first attempt of the kind was made by sir william herschel in eighteen o one and a very notable one it was meteorological statistics save of the scantiest and most casual kind did not then exist but the price of corn from year to year was on record and this with full recognition of its inadequacy he adopted as his criterion nor was he much better off for information respecting the solar condition what little he could obtain however served as he believed to confirm his surmise that a copious emission of light and heat accompanies an abundant formation of openings in the dazzling substance whence our supply of those indispensable commodities is derived he gathered in short from his inquiries very much what he had expected to gather namely that the price of wheat was high when the sun showed an unsullied surface and that food and spots became plentiful together yet this plausible inference was scarcely borne out by a more exact collocation of facts schwab failed to detect any reflection of the sun-spot period in his meteorological register gautier reached a provisional conclusion the reverse though not markedly the reverse of herschel's wolf in eighteen fifty two derived from an examination of vogel's collection of zurich chronicles one thousand to eighteen hundred a d evidence showing as he thought that minimum years were usually wet and stormy maximum years dry and genial but a subsequent review of the subject in eighteen fifty nine convinced him that no relation of any kind between the two kinds of effects was traceable with the singular affection of our atmosphere known as the aurora borealis more properly aurora polaris the case was different here the zurich chronicles set wolf on the right track in leading him to associate such luminous manifestations with a disturbed condition of the sun since subsequent detailed observation has exhibited the curve of auroral frequency as following with such fidelity the jagged lines figuring to the eye the fluctuations of solar and magnetic activity as to leave no reasonable doubt that all three rise and sink together under the influence of a common cause as long ago as seventeen sixteen halley had conjectured that the northern lights were due to magnetic effluvia 
but there was no evidence on the subject forthcoming until hiorter observed at upsala in seventeen forty one their agitating influence upon the magnetic needle that the effect was no casual one was made superabundantly clear by arago's researches in eighteen nineteen and subsequent years now both were perceived to be swayed by the same obscure power of cosmical disturbance the sun is not the only one of the heavenly bodies by which the magnetism of the earth is affected proofs of a similar kind of lunar action were laid by Kreil in eighteen forty one before the bohemian society of sciences and with minor corrections were fully substantiated by sabine's more extended researches it was thus ascertained that each lunar day or the interval of twenty-four hours and about fifty-four minutes between two successive meridian passages of our satellite is marked by a perceptible though very small double oscillation of the needle two progressive movements from east to west and two returns from west to east moreover the lunar like the solar influence as was proved in each case by sabine's analysis of the hobarton and toronto observations extends to all three magnetic elements affecting not only the position of the horizontal or declination needle but also the dip and intensity it seems not unreasonable to attribute some portion of the same subtle power to the planets and even to the stars though with effects rendered imperceptible by distance we have now to speak of the discovery and application to the heavenly bodies of a totally new method of investigation spectrum analysis may be shortly described as a mode of distinguishing the various species of matter by the kind of light proceeding from each this definition at once explains how it is that unlike every other system of chemical analysis it has proved available in astronomy light so far as quality is concerned ignores distance no intrinsic change that we yet know of is produced in it by a journey from the farthest bounds of the visible universe so that provided only that in quantity it remains sufficient for the purpose its peculiarities can be equally well studied whether the source of its vibrations be one foot or a hundred billion miles distant now the most obvious distinction between one kind of light and another resides in colour but of this distinction the eye takes cognizance in an aesthetic not in a scientific sense it finds gladness in the thousand tints of nature but can neither analyse nor define them here the refracting prism or the combination of prisms known as the spectroscope comes to its aid teaching it to measure as well as to perceive it furnishes in a word an accurate scale of colour the various rays which entering the eye together in a confused crowd produce a compound impression made up of undistinguishable elements are by the mere passage through a triangular piece of glass separated one from the other and ranged side by side in orderly succession so that it becomes possible to tell at a glance what kinds of light are present and what absent thus if we could only be assured that the various chemical substances when made to glow by heat emit characteristic rays rays that is occupying a place in the spectrum reserved for them and for them only we should at once be in possession of a mode of identifying such substances with the utmost readiness and certainty this assurance which forms the solid basis of spectrum analysis was obtained slowly and with difficulty the first to employ the prism in the examination of various flames for it is only in a state of vapour that matter emits distinctive light was a young scotchman named thomas melville who died in seventeen fifty three at the age of twenty seven he studied the spectrum of burning spirits into which were successively introduced sal ammoniac potash alum nitre and sea salt and observed the singular predominance under almost all circumstances of a particular shade of yellow light perfectly definite in its degree of refrangibility in other words taking up a perfectly definite position in the spectrum his experiments were repeated by morgan wollaston and with far superior precision and diligence by fraunhofer the great munich optician whose work was completely original rediscovered melville's deep yellow ray and measured its place in the colour scale 
it has since become well known as the sodium line and has played a very important part in the history of spectrum analysis nevertheless its ubiquity and conspicuousness long impeded progress it was elicited by the combustion of a surprising variety of substances sulphur alcohol ivory wood paper its persistent visibility suggesting the accomplishment of some universal process of nature rather than the presence of one individual kind of matter but if spectrum analysis were to exist as a science at all it could only be by attaining certainty as to the unvarying association of one special substance with each special quality of light thus perplexed fox talbot hesitated in eighteen twenty six to enounce this fundamental principle he was inclined to believe that the presence in the spectrum of any individual ray told unerringly of the volatilization in the flame under scrutiny of some body as whose badge or distinctive symbol that ray might be regarded but the continual prominence of the yellow beam staggered him it appeared indeed without fail where sodium was but it also appeared where it might be thought only reasonable to conclude that sodium was not nor was it until thirty years later that william swan by pointing out the extreme delicacy of the spectral test and the singularly wide dispersion of sodium made it appear probable but even then only probable that the questionable yellow line was really due invariably to that substance common salt chloride of sodium is in fact the most diffusive of solids it floats in the air it flows with water every grain of dust has its attendant particle its absolute exclusion approaches the impossible and with all the light that it gives in burning is so intense and concentrated that if a single grain be divided into one hundred and eighty million parts and one alone of such inconceivably minute fragments be present in a source of light the spectroscope will show unmistakably its characteristic beam amongst the pioneers of knowledge in this direction were sir john herschel who however applied himself to the subject in the interests of optics not of chemistry w a miller and wheatstone the last especially made a notable advance when in the course of his studies on the prismatic decomposition of the electric light he reached the significant conclusion that the rays visible in its spectrum were different for each kind of metal employed as electrodes thus indications of a wider principle were to be found in several quarters but no positive certainty on any single point was obtained until in eighteen fifty nine gustav kirchhoff professor of physics in the university of heidelberg and his colleague the eminent chemist robert bunsen took the matter in hand by them the general question as to the necessary and invariable connection of certain rays in the spectrum with certain kinds of matter was first resolutely confronted and first definitely answered it was answered affirmatively else there could have been no science of spectrum analysis as the result of experiments more numerous more stringent and more precise than had previously been undertaken and the assurance of their conclusion was rendered doubly sure by the discovery through the peculiarities of their light alone of two new metals named from the blue and red rays by which they were respectively distinguished cesium and rubidium both were immediately afterwards actually obtained in small quantities by evaporation of the durkheim mineral waters the link connecting this important result with astronomy may now be indicated in the year eighteen o two it occurred to william hyde wollaston to substitute for the round hole used by newton and his successors for the admittance of light to be examined with the prism an elongated crevice one twentieth of an inch in width he thereupon perceived that the spectrum thus formed of light as it were purified by the abolition of overlapping images was traversed by seven dark lines these he took to be natural boundaries of the various colours and satisfied with this quasi-explanation allowed the subject to drop 
it was independently taken up after twelve years by a man of higher genius in the course of experiments on light directed towards the perfecting of his achromatic lenses fraunhofer by means of a slit and a telescope made the surprising discovery that the solar spectrum is crossed not by seven but by thousands of obscure transverse streaks of these he counted some six hundred and carefully mapped three hundred and twenty four while a few of the most conspicuous he set up if we may be permitted the expression as landmarks measuring their distances apart with a theodolite and affixing to them the letters of the alphabet by which they are still universally known nor did he stop here the same system of examination applied to the rest of the heavenly bodies showed the mild effulgence of the moon and planets to be deficient in precisely the same rays as sunlight while in the stars it disclosed the differences in likeness which are always an earnest of increased knowledge the spectra of sirius and castor instead of being delicately ruled crosswise throughout like that of the sun were seen to be interrupted by three massive bars of darkness two in the blue and one in the green the light of pollux on the other hand seemed precisely similar to sunlight attenuated by distance or reflection and that of capella betelgeuse and procyon to share some of its peculiarities one solar line especially that marked in his map with the letter d proved common to all the four last-mentioned stars and it was remarkable that it exactly coincided in position with the conspicuous yellow beam afterwards as we have said identified with the light of glowing sodium which he had already found to accompany most kinds of combustion moreover both the dark solar and the bright terrestrial d lines were displayed by the refined munich appliances as double in this striking correspondence discovered by fraunhofer in eighteen fifteen was contained the very essence of solar chemistry but its true significance did not become apparent until long afterwards fraunhofer was by profession not a physicist but a practical optician time pressed he could not and would not deviate from his appointed track all that was possible to him was to indicate the road to discovery and exhort others to follow it partially and inconclusively at first this was done the fixed lines as they were called of the solar spectrum took up the position of a standing problem to the solution of which no approach seemed possible conjectures as to their origin were indeed rife an explanation put forward by zantadeschi and others and dubiously favoured by sir david brewster and dr j h gladstone was that they resulted from interference that is a destruction of the motion producing in our eyes the sensation of light by the superposition of two light waves in such a manner that the crests of one exactly fill up the hollows of the other this effect was supposed to be brought about by imperfections in the optical apparatus employed a more plausible view was that the atmosphere of the earth was the agent by which sunlight was deprived of its missing beams for a few of them this is actually the case brewster found in eighteen thirty two that certain dark lines which were invisible when the sun stood high in the heavens became increasingly conspicuous as he approached the horizon these are the well-known atmospheric lines but the immense majority of their companions in the spectrum remain quite unaffected by the thickness of the stratum of air traversed by the sunlight containing them they are then obviously due to another cause there remained the true interpretation absorption in the sun's atmosphere and this too was extensively canvassed but a remarkable observation made by professor forbes of edinburgh on the occasion of the annular eclipse of may fifteenth eighteen thirty six appeared to throw discredit upon it if the problematical dark lines were really occasioned by the stoppage of certain rays through the action of a vaporous envelope surrounding the sun they ought it seemed to be strongest in light proceeding from his edges which cutting that envelope obliquely passed through a much greater depth of it but the circle of light left by the interposing moon and of course derived entirely from the rim of the solar disk yielded to forbes's examination precisely the same spectrum as light coming from its central parts this circumstance helped to baffle inquirers already sufficiently perplexed it still remains an anomaly 
of which no satisfactory explanation has been offered end of part two chapter one part one part two chapter one of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by agnes mary clark chapter one foundation of astronomical physics part two convincing evidence as to the true nature of the solar lines was however at length in the autumn of eighteen fifty nine brought forward at heidelberg kirchhoff's experimentum crucis in the matter was a very simple one he threw bright sunshine across a space occupied by vapour of sodium and perceived with astonishment that the dark fraunhofer line d instead of being effaced by flame giving a luminous ray of the same refrangibility was deepened and thickened by the superposition he tried the same experiment substituting for sunbeams light from a drummond lamp and with similar result a dark furrow corresponding in every respect to the solar d line was instantly seen to interrupt the otherwise unbroken radiance of its spectrum the inference was irresistible that the effect thus produced artificially was brought about naturally in the same way and that sodium formed an ingredient in the glowing atmosphere of the sun this first discovery was quickly followed up by the identification of numerous bright rays in the spectra of other metallic bodies with others of the hitherto mysterious fraunhofer lines kirchhoff was thus led to the conclusion that besides sodium iron magnesium calcium and chromium are certainly solar constituents and that copper zinc barium and nickel are also present though in smaller quantities as to cobalt he hesitated to pronounce but its existence in the sun has since been established these memorable results were founded upon a general principle first enunciated by kirchhoff in a communication to the berlin academy december fifteenth eighteen fifty nine and afterwards more fully developed by him it may be expressed as follows substances of every kind are opaque to the precise rays which they emit at the same temperature that is to say they stop the kinds of light or heat which they are then actually in a condition to radiate but it does not follow that cool bodies absorb the rays which they would give out if sufficiently heated hydrogen at ordinary temperatures for instance is almost perfectly transparent but if raised to the glowing point as by the passage of electricity it then becomes capable of arresting and at the same time of displaying in its own spectrum light of four distinct colours this principle is fundamental to solar chemistry it gives the key to the hieroglyphics of the fraunhofer lines the identical characters which are written bright in terrestrial spectra are written dark in the unrolled sheaf of sun-rays the meaning remains unchanged it must however be remembered that they are only relatively dark the substances stopping those particular tints in the neighbourhood of the sun are at the same time vividly glowing with the very same remove the dazzling solar background by contrast with which they show as obscure and they will be seen and at critical moments actually have been seen in all their native splendour it is because the atmosphere of the sun is cooler than the globe it envelops that the different kinds of vapour constituting that atmosphere take more than they give absorb more light than they are capable of emitting raise them to the same temperature as the sun itself and their powers of emission and absorption being brought exactly to the same level the thousands of dusky rays in the solar spectrum will be at once obliterated 
the establishment of the terrestrial science of spectrum analysis was due as we have seen equally to kirchhoff and bunsen but its celestial application to kirchhoff alone he effected this object of the aspirations more or less dim of many other thinkers and workers by the union of two separate though closely related lines of research the study of the different kinds of light emitted by various bodies and the study of the different kinds of light absorbed by them the latter branch appears to have been first entered upon by dr thomas young in eighteen o three it was pursued by the younger herschel by william allen miller brewster and gladstone brewster indeed made in eighteen thirty three a formal attempt to found what might be called an inverse system of analysis with the prism based upon absorption and his efforts were repeated just a quarter of a century later by gladstone but no general point of view was attained nor it may be added was it by this path attainable kirchhoff's map of the solar spectrum drawn to scale with exquisite accuracy and printed in three shades of ink to convey the graduated obscurity of the lines was published in the transactions of the berlin academy for eighteen sixty one and eighteen sixty two representations of the principal lines belonging to various elementary bodies formed as it were a series of marginal notes accompanying the great solar scroll enabling the various tyro in the new science to decipher its meaning at a glance where the dark solar and bright metallic rays agreed in position it might safely be inferred that the metal emitting them was a solar constituent and such coincidences were numerous in the case of iron alone no less than sixty occurred in one half of the spectral area rendering the chances absolutely overwhelming against mere casual conjunction the preparation of this elaborate picture proved so trying to the eyes that kirchhoff was compelled by failing vision to resign the latter half of the task to his pupil hoffman the complete map measured nearly eight feet in length the conclusions reached by kirchhoff were no sooner announced than they took their place with scarcely a dissenting voice among the established truths of science the broad result that the dark lines in the spectrum of the sun afford an index to its chemical composition no less reliable than any of the tests used in the laboratory was equally captivating to the imagination of the vulgar and authentic in the judgment of the learned and like all genuine advances in the knowledge of nature it stimulated curiosity far more than it gratified it now the history of how discoveries were missed is often quite as instructive as the history of how they were made it may then be worth while to expend a few words on the thoughts and trials by which in the present case the actual event was heralded three times it seemed on the verge of being anticipated the experiment which in kirchhoff's hands proved decisive of passing sunlight through glowing vapours and examining the superposed spectra was performed by professor w a miller of king's college in eighteen forty five nay more it was performed with express reference to the question then already as has been noted in debate of the possible production of von hofer's lines by absorption in a solar atmosphere yet it led to nothing again at paris in eighteen forty nine with a view to testing the asserted coincidence between the solar d line and the bright yellow beam in the spectrum of the electric arc really due to the unsuspected presence of sodium leon foucault threw a ray of sunshine across the arc and observed its spectrum he was surprised to see that the d line was rendered more intensely dark by the combination of lights to assure himself still further he substituted a reflected image of one of the white-hot carbon points for the sunbeam with an identical result the same ray was missing it needed but another step to have generalized this result and thus laid hold of a natural truth of the highest importance but that step was not taken 
foucault keen and brilliant though he was rested satisfied with the information that the voltaic arc had the power of stopping the kind of light emitted by it he asked no further question and was consequently the bearer of no further intelligence on the subject the truth conveyed by this remarkable experiment was however divined by one eminent man professor stokes of cambridge stated to sir william thompson now lord kelvin shortly after it had been made his conviction that an absorbing atmosphere of sodium surrounded the sun and so forcibly was his hearer impressed with the weight of the argument based upon the absolute agreement of the d-line in the solar spectrum with the yellow ray of burning sodium then freshly certified by w h miller combined with foucault's reversal of that ray that he regularly inculcated in his public lectures on natural philosophy at glasgow five or six years before kirchhoff's discovery not only the fact of the presence of sodium in the solar neighbourhood but also the principle of the study of solar and stellar chemistry in the spectra of flames yet it does not appear to have occurred to either of these two distinguished professors themselves among the foremost of their time in the successful search for new truths to verify practically a sagacious conjecture in which was contained the possibility of a scientific revolution it is just to add that kirchhoff was unacquainted when he undertook his investigation either with the experiment of foucault or the speculation of stokes for c j angstrom on the other hand perhaps somewhat too much has been claimed in the way of anticipation his optical researches appeared at upsala in eighteen fifty three and in their english garb two years later they were undoubtedly pregnant with suggestion yet made no epoch in discovery the old perplexities continued to prevail after as before their publication to angstrom indeed belongs the great merit of having revived euler's principle of the equivalence of emission and absorption but he revived it in its original crude form and without the qualifying proviso which alone gave it value as a clue to new truths according to his statement a body absorbs all the series of vibrations it is under any circumstances capable of emitting as well as those connected with them by simple harmonic relations this is far too wide to render it either true or useful it had to be reduced to the cautious terms employed by kirchhoff radiation strictly and necessarily corresponds with absorption only when the temperature is the same in point of fact angstrom was still in eighteen fifty three divided between absorption and interference as the mode of origin of the fraunhofer dark rays very important however was his demonstration of the compound nature of the spark spectrum which he showed to be made up of the spectrum of the metallic electrodes superposed upon that of the gas or gases across which the discharge passed it may here be useful since without some clear ideas on the subject no proper understanding of recent astronomical progress is possible to take a cursory view of the elementary principles of spectrum analysis to many of our readers they are doubtless already familiar but it is better to appear trite to some than obscure even to a few the spectrum then of a body is simply the light proceeding from it spread out by refraction into a brilliant variegated band passing from brownish red through crimson orange yellow green and azure into dusky violet the reason of this spreading out or dispersion is that the various colours have different wave lengths and consequently meet with different degrees of retardation in traversing the denser medium of the prism the shortest and quickest vibrations producing the sensation we call violet are thrown farthest away from their original path in other words suffer the widest deviation the longest and slowest the red travel much nearer to it thus the sheaf of rays which would otherwise combine into a patch of white light are separated through the divergence of their tracks after refraction by a prism so as to form a tinted riband this visible spectrum is prolonged invisibly at both ends by a long range of vibrations either too rapid or too sluggish to affect the eye as light but recognizable through their chemical and heating effects 
now all incandescent solid or liquid substances and even gases ignited under great pressure give what is called a continuous spectrum that is to say the light derived from them is of every conceivable hue sorted out with the prism its tints merge imperceptibly one into the other uninterrupted by any dark spaces no colours in short are missing but gases and vapours rendered luminous by heat emit rays of only a few tints which accordingly form an interrupted spectrum usually designated as one of lines or bands and since these rays are perfectly definite and characteristic not being the same for any two substances it is easy to tell what kind of matter is concerned in producing them we may suppose that the inconceivably minute particles which by their rapid thrilling agitate the ethereal medium so as to produce light are free to give out their peculiar tone of vibration only when floating apart from each other in gaseous form but when crowded together into a condensed mass the clear ring of the distinctive note is drowned so to speak in a universal molecular clang thus prismatic analysis has no power to identify individual kinds of matter except when they present themselves as glowing vapours a spectrum is said to be reversed when lines previously seen bright on a dark background appear dark on a bright background in this form it is equally characteristic of chemical composition with the direct spectrum being due to absorption as the latter is to emission and absorption and emission are by kirchhoff's law strictly correlative this is easily understood by the analogy of sound for just as a tuning fork responds to sound waves of its own pitch but remains indifferent to those of any other so those particles of matter whose nature it is when set swinging by heat to vibrate a certain number of times in a second thus giving rise to light of a particular shade of colour appropriate those same vibrations and those only when transmitted past them or phrasing it otherwise are opaque to them and transparent to all others it should further be explained that the shape of the bright or dark spaces in the spectrum has nothing whatever to do with the nature of the phenomena the lines and bands so frequently spoken of are seen as such for no other reason than because the light forming them is admitted through a narrow straight opening change that opening into a fine crescent or a sinuous curve and the lines will at once appear as crescents or curves resuming in a sentence what has been already explained we find that the prismatic analysis of the heavenly bodies was founded upon three classes of facts first the unmistakable character of the light given by each different kind of glowing vapour secondly the identity of the light absorbed with the light emitted by each thirdly the coincidence observed between rays missing from the solar spectrum and rays absorbed by various terrestrial substances thus a realm of knowledge pronounced by morinus in the seventeenth century and no less dogmatically by auguste comte in the nineteenth hopelessly out of reach of the human intellect was thrown freely open and the chemistry of the sun and stars took at once a leading place among the experimental sciences the immediate increase of knowledge was not the chief result of kirchhoff's labours still more important was the change in the scope and methods of astronomy which set on foot in eighteen fifty two by the detection of a common period affecting at once the spots on the sun and the magnetism of the earth was extended and accelerated by the discovery of spectrum analysis the nature of that change is concisely indicated by the heading of the present chapter we would now ask our readers to endeavour to realise somewhat distinctly what is implied by the foundation of astronomical physics just three centuries ago kepler drew a forecast of what he called a physical astronomy a science treating of the efficient causes of planetary motion and holding the key to the inner astronomy what kepler dreamed of and groped after newton realised he showed the beautiful and symmetrical revolutions of the solar system to be governed by a uniformly acting cause and that cause no other than the familiar force of gravity which gives stability to all our terrestrial surroundings 
the world under our feet was thus for the first time brought into physical connection with the world's peopling space and a very tangible relationship was demonstrated as existing between what used to be called the corruptible matter of the earth and the incorruptible matter of the heavens this process of unification of the cosmos this levelling of the celestial with the sublunary was carried no farther until the fact unexpectedly emerged from a vast and complicated mass of observations that the magnetism of the earth is subject to subtle influences emanating certainly from some and presumably from all of the heavenly bodies the inference being thus rendered at least plausible that a force not less universal than gravity itself but with whose modes of action we are as yet unacquainted pervades the universe and forms it might be said an intangible bond of sympathy between its parts now for the investigation of this influence two roads are open it may be pursued by observation either of the bodies from which it proceeds or of the effects which it produces that is to say either by the astronomer or by the physicist or better still by both concurrently their acquisitions are mutually profitable nor can either be considered as independent of the other any important accession to knowledge respecting the sun for example may be expected to cast a reflected light on the still obscure subject of terrestrial magnetism while discoveries in magnetism or its alter ego electricity must profoundly affect solar inquiries the establishment of the new method of spectrum analysis drew far closer this alliance between celestial and terrestrial science indeed they have come to merge so intimately one into the other that it is no easier to trace their respective boundaries than it is to draw a clear dividing line between the animal and vegetable kingdoms yet up to the middle of the last century astronomy while maintaining her strict union with mathematics looked with indifference on the rest of the sciences it was enough that she possessed the telescope and the calculus now the materials for her inductions are supplied by the chemist the electrician the inquirer into the most recondite mysteries of light and the molecular constitution of matter she is concerned with what the geologist the meteorologist even the biologist has to say she can afford to close her ears to no new truth of the physical order her position of lofty isolation has been exchanged for one of community and mutual aid the astronomer has become in the highest sense of the term a physicist while the physicist is bound to be something of an astronomer this then is what is designed to be conveyed by the foundation of astronomical or cosmical physics it means the establishment of a science of nature whose conclusions are not only presumed by analogy but are ascertained by observation to be valid wherever light can travel and gravity is obeyed a science by which the nature of the stars can be studied upon the earth and the nature of the earth can be made better known by study of the stars a science in a word which is or aims at being one and universal even as nature the visible reflection of the invisible highest unity is one and universal it is not too much to say that a new birth of knowledge has ensued the astronomy so signally promoted by bessel the astronomy placed by comte at the head of the hierarchy of the physical sciences was the science of the movements of the heavenly bodies and there were those who began to regard it as a science which from its very perfection had ceased to be interesting whose tale of discoveries was told and whose farther advance must be in the line of minute technical improvements not of novel and stirring disclosures but the science of the nature of the heavenly bodies is one only in the beginning of its career it is full of the audacities the inconsistencies the imperfections the possibilities of youth it promises everything it has already performed much it will doubtless perform much more the means at its disposal are vast and are being daily augmented what has so far been secured by them it must now be our task to extricate from more doubtful surroundings and place in due order before our readers end of part two chapter one part 
two part two chapter two of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by agnes mary clark chapter two solar observations and theories part one the zeal with which solar studies have been pursued during the last half century has already gone far to redeem the neglect of the two preceding ones since schwab's discovery was published in eighteen fifty one observers have multiplied new facts have been rapidly accumulated and the previous comparative quiescence of thought on the great subject of the constitution of the sun has been replaced by a bewildering variety of speculations conjectures and more or less justifiable inferences it is satisfactory to find this novel impulse not only shared but to a large extent guided by our countrymen william rudder dawes one of many clergymen eminent in astronomy observed in eighteen fifty two with the help of a solar eyepiece of his own devising some curious details of spot structure the umbra heretofore taken for the darkest part of the spot was seen to be suffused with a mottled nebulous illumination in marked contrast with the striated appearance of the penumbra while through this cloudy stratum a black opening permitted the eye to divine farther unfathomable depths beyond the whole thus disclosed evidently the true nucleus was found to be present in all considerable as well as in many small maculae again the whirling motions of some of these objects were noticed by him the remarkable form of one sketched at wateringbury in kent january seventeenth eighteen fifty two gave him the means of detecting and measuring a rotatory movement of the whole spot round the black nucleus at the rate of one hundred degrees in six days it appeared he said as if some prodigious ascending force of a whirlwind character in bursting through the cloudy stratum and the two higher and luminous strata had given to the whole a movement resembling its own an interpretation founded as is easily seen on the herschelian theory then still in full credit an instance of the same kind was observed by mr w r burt in eighteen sixty and cyclonic movements are now a recognized feature of sun-spots they are however as father secchi concluded from his long experience but temporary and casual scarcely three per cent of all spots visible exhibit the spiral structure which should invariably result if a conflict of opposing or the friction of unequal currents were essential and not merely incidental to their origin a whirlpool phase not unfrequently accompanies their formation and may be renewed at periods of recrudescence or dissolution but it is both partial and inconstant sometimes affecting only one side of a spot sometimes slackening gradually its movement in one direction to resume it after a brief pause in the opposite persistent and uniform motions such as the analogy of terrestrial storms would absolutely require are not to be found so that the cyclonic theory of sun-spots suggested by herschel in eighteen forty seven and urged from a different point of view by fay in eighteen seventy two may be said to have completely broken down the drift of spots over the sun's surface was first systematically investigated by carrington a self-constituted astronomer gifted with the courage and the instinct of thoughtful labour born at chelsea in may eighteen twenty six richard christopher carrington entered trinity college cambridge in eighteen forty four he was intended for the church but professor chalice's lectures diverted him to astronomy and he resolved as soon as he had taken his degree to prepare with all possible diligence to follow his new vocation his father who was a brewer on a large scale at brentford offered no opposition 
ample means were at his disposal nevertheless he chose to serve an apprenticeship of three years as observer in the university of durham as though his sole object had been to earn a livelihood he quitted the post only when he found that its restricted opportunities offered no farther prospect of self-improvement he now built an observatory of his own at redhill in surrey with the design of completing bessel's and argelander's survey of the northern heavens by adding to it the circumpolar stars omitted from their view this project successfully carried out between eighteen fifty four and eighteen fifty seven had another and still larger one superposed upon it before it had even begun to be executed in eighteen fifty two while the red hill observatory was in course of erection the discovery of the coincidence between the sun-spot and magnetic periods was announced carrington was profoundly interested and devoted his enforced leisure to the examination of records both written and depicted of past solar observations struck with their fragmentary and inconsistent character he resolved to appropriate as he said by close and methodical research the eleven-year period next ensuing he calculated rightly that he should have the field pretty nearly to himself for many reasons conspired to make public observatories slow in taking up new subjects and amateurs with freedom to choose and means to treat them effectually were scarcer then than they are now the execution of this laborious task was commenced november ninth eighteen fifty three it was intended to be merely a paragon a second subject upon which daylight energies might be spent while the hours of night were reserved for cataloguing those stars that are bereft of the baths of ocean its results however proved of the highest interest although the vicissitudes of life barred the completion in its full integrity of the original design by the death in eighteen fifty eight of the elder carrington the charge of the brewery devolved upon his son and eventually absorbed so much of his care that it was found advisable to bring the solar observations to a premature close on march twenty fourth eighteen sixty one his scientific life may be said to have closed with them attacked four years later with severe and in its results permanent illness he disposed of the brentwood business and withdrew to chert near farnham in surrey there in a lonely spot on the top of a detached conical hill known as the devil's jump he built a second observatory and erected an instrument which he was no longer able to use with pristine effectiveness and there november twenty seventh eighteen seventy five he died of the rupture of a blood vessel on the brain before he had completed his fiftieth year his observations of sun-spots were of a geometrical character they concerned positions and movements leaving out of sight physical peculiarities indeed the prudence with which he limited his task to what came strictly within the range of his powers to accomplish was one of carrington's most valuable qualities the method of his observations moreover was chosen with the same practical sagacity as their objects as early as eighteen forty seven sir john herschel had recommended the daily self-registration of sun-spots and he enforced the suggestion with more immediate prospect of success in eighteen fifty four the art of celestial photography however was even then in a purely tentative stage and carrington wisely resolved to waste no time on dubious experiments but employ the means of registration and measurement actually at his command these were very simple yet very effective to the helioscope employed by father shiner two centuries and a quarter earlier a species of micrometer was added the image of the sun was projected upon a screen by means of a firmly clamped telescope in the focus of which were placed two cross wires forming angles of forty five degrees with the meridian the six instants were then carefully noted at which these were met by the edges of the disc as it traversed the screen and by the nucleus of the spot to be measured a short process of calculation then gave the exact position of the spot as referred to the sun's centre 
from a series of five thousand two hundred and ninety observations made in this way together with a great number of accurate drawings carrington derived conclusions of great importance on each of the three points which he had proposed to himself to investigate these were the law of the sun's rotation the existence and direction of systematic currents and the distribution of spots on the solar surface grave discrepancies were early perceived to exist between determinations of the sun's rotation by different observers galileo with comfortable generality estimated the period at about a lunar month shiner at twenty-seven days cassini in sixteen seventy eight made it twenty five point fifty eight delambre in seventeen seventy five no more than twenty-five days later inquiries brought these divergences within no more tolerable limits langier's result of twenty five point thirty four days obtained in eighteen forty one enjoyed the highest credit yet it differed widely in one direction from that of berm eighteen fifty two giving twenty five point five two days and in the other from that of kisius eighteen forty six giving twenty five point zero nine days now the cause of these variations was really obvious from the first although for a long time strangely overlooked shiner pointed out in sixteen thirty that different spots gave different periods adding the significant remark that one at a distance from the solar equator revolved more slowly than those nearer to it but the hint was wasted for upwards of two centuries ideas on the subject were either retrograde or stationary what were called the proper motions of spots were however recognized by schroter and utterly baffled langier who despaired of obtaining any concordant result as to the sun's rotation except by taking the mean of a number of discordant ones at last in eighteen fifty five a valuable course of observations made at capo di monte naples in eighteen forty five to six enabled c h f peters to set in the clearest light the insecurity of determinations based on the assumption of fixity in objects plainly affected by movements uncertain both in amount and direction such was the state of affairs when carrington entered upon his task everything was in confusion the most that could be said was that the confusion had come to be distinctly admitted and referred to its true source what he discovered was this that the sun or at least the outer shell of the sun visible to us has no single period of rotation but drifts round carrying the spots with it at a rate continually accelerated from the poles to the equator in other words the time of axial revolution is shortest at the equator and lengthens with increase of latitude carrington devised a mathematical formula by which the rate or law of this lengthening was conveniently expressed but it was a purely empirical one it was a concise statement but implied no physical interpretation it summarized but did not explain the facts an assumed mean period for the solar rotation of twenty five point thirty eight days twenty five days nine hours very nearly was thus found to be actually conformed to only in two parallels of solar latitude fourteen degrees north and south while the equatorial period was slightly less than twenty five and that of latitude fifty degrees rose to twenty seven days and a half these curious results gave quite a new direction to ideas on solar physics the other two elements of the sun's rotation were also ascertained by carrington with hitherto unattained precision he fixed the inclination of its axis to the ecliptic at eighty two degrees forty five minutes the longitude of the ascending node at seventy three degrees forty minutes for the epoch 1850 a d these data which have scarcely yet been improved upon suffice to determine the position in space of the sun's equator its north pole is directed towards a star in the coils of the dragon midway between vega and the pole star its plane intersects that of the earth's orbit in such a way that our planet finds itself in the same level on or about the third of june and the fifth of december when any spots visible on the disc cross it in apparently straight lines at other times the paths pursued by them seem curved downward to an observer in the northern hemisphere between june and december upward between december and june 
a singular peculiarity in the distribution of sun-spots emerged from carrington's studies at the time of the minimum of eighteen fifty six two broad belts of the solar surface as we have seen are frequented by them of which the limits may be put at six degrees and thirty five degrees of north and south latitude individual equatorial spots are not uncommon but nearer to the poles than thirty five degrees they are a rare exception carrington observed as an extreme instance in july eighteen fifty eight one in south latitude forty four degrees and peters in june eighteen forty six watched during several days a spot in fifty degrees twenty four minutes north latitude but beyond this no true macula has ever been seen for la Hire's reported observation of one in latitude seventy degrees is now believed to have had its place on the solar globe erroneously assigned and the veiled spots described by trouvelot in eighteen seventy five as occurring within ten degrees of the pole can only be regarded as at the most the same kind of disturbance in an undeveloped form but the novelty of carrington's observations consisted in the detection of certain changes in distribution concurrent with the progress of the eleven-year period as the minimum approached the spot zones contracted towards the equator and there finally vanished then as if by a fresh impulse spots suddenly reappeared in high latitude and spread downwards with the development of the new phase of activity scarcely had this remark been made public when wolf found a confirmation of its general truth in berm's observations during the years eighteen thirty three to thirty six and a perfectly similar behaviour was noted both by spurrer and secchi at the minimum epoch of eighteen sixty seven the ensuing period gave corresponding indications and it may now be looked upon as established that the spot zones close in towards the equator with the advance of each cycle their activity culminating as a rule in a mean latitude of about sixteen degrees and expiring when it is reduced to six degrees before this happens however a completely new disturbance will have manifested itself some thirty-five degrees north and south of the equator and will have begun to travel over the same course as its predecessor each series of sun-spots is thus to some extent overlapped by the succeeding one so that while the average interval from one maximum to the next is eleven years the period of each distinct wave of agitation is twelve or fourteen curious evidence of the retarded character of the maximum of eighteen eighty three to four was to be found in the unusually low latitude of the spot zones when it occurred their movement downward having gone on regularly while the crisis was postponed its final symptoms were hence displaced locally as well as in time the law of zones was duly obeyed at the minima of eighteen ninety and nineteen o one and spurrer found evidence of conformity to it so far back as sixteen nineteen his researches however also showed that it was in abeyance during some seventy years previously to seventeen sixteen during which period sun-spots remained persistently scarce and auroral displays were feeble and infrequent even in high northern latitudes an unaccountable suspension of solar activity is in fact indicated gustav spurrer born at berlin in eighteen twenty two began to observe sun-spots with the view of assigning the law of solar rotation in december eighteen sixty his assiduity and success with limited means attracted attention and a government endowment was procured for his little solar observatory at enclame in pomerania the crown prince afterwards emperor frederick adding a five-inch refractor to its modest equipment unaware of carrington's discovery not made known until january eighteen fifty nine he arrived at and published in june eighteen sixty one a similar conclusion as to the equatorial quickening of the sun's movement on its axis appointed observer in the new astrophysical establishment at potsdam in eighteen seventy four he continued his sun-spot determinations there for twenty years and died july seventh eighteen ninety five 
the time had now evidently come for a fundamental revision of current notions respecting the nature of the sun herschel's theory of a cool dark habitable globe surrounded by and protected against the radiations of a luminous and heat-giving envelope was shattered by the first dicta of spectrum analysis traces of it may be found for a few years subsequent to eighteen fifty nine but they are obviously survivals from an earlier order of ideas doomed to speedy extinction it needs only a moment's consideration of the meaning at last found for the fraunhofer lines to see the incompatibility of the new facts with the old conceptions they implied not only the presence near the sun as glowing vapours of bodies highly refractory to heat but that these glowing vapours formed the relatively cool envelope of a still hotter internal mass kirchhoff accordingly included in his great memoir on the solar spectrum read before the berlin academy of sciences july eleventh eighteen sixty one an exposition of the views on the subject to which his memorable investigations had led him they may be briefly summarized as follows since the body of the sun gives a continuous spectrum it must be either solid or liquid while the interruptions in its light prove it to be surrounded by a complex atmosphere of metallic vapours somewhat cooler than itself spots are simply clouds due to local depressions of temperature differing in no respect from terrestrial clouds except as regards the kinds of matter composing them these sun clouds take their origin in the zones of encounter between polar and equatorial currents in the solar atmosphere this explanation was liable to all the objections urged against the cumulus theory on the one hand and the trade wind theory on the other setting aside its propounder it was consistently upheld perhaps by no man eminent in science except spurrer and his advocacy of it proved ineffective to secure its general adoption m fay of the of the paris academy of sciences was the first to propose a coherent scheme of the solar constitution covering the whole range of new discovery the fundamental ideas on the subject now in vogue here made their first connected appearance much indeed remained to be modified and corrected but the transition was finally made from the old to the new order of thought the essence of the change may be conveyed in a single sentence the sun was thenceforth regarded not as a mere heated body or still more remotely from the truth as a cool body unaccountably spun round with a cocoon of fire but as a vast heat radiating machine the terrestrial analogy was abandoned in one more particular besides that of temperature the solar system of circulation instead of being adapted like that of the earth to the distribution of heat received from without was seen to be directed towards the transportation towards the surface of the heat contained within polar and equatorial currents tending to a purely superficial equalization of temperature were replaced by vertical currents bringing up successive portions of the intensely heated interior mass to contribute their share in turn to the radiation into space which might be called the proper function of a sun fay's view which were communicated to the academy of sciences january sixteenth eighteen sixty five were avowedly based on the anomalous mode of solar rotation discovered by carrington this may be regarded either as an acceleration increasing from the poles to the equator or as a retardation increasing from the equator to the poles according to the rate of revolution we choose to assume for the unseen nucleus fay preferred to consider it a retardation produced by ascending currents continually left behind as the sphere widened in which the matter composing them was forced to travel he further supposed that the depth from which these vertical currents rose and consequently the amount of retardation effected by their ascent to the surface became progressively greater as the poles were approached owing to the considerable flattening of the spheroidal surface from which they started but the adoption of this expedient has been shown to involve inadmissible consequences the extreme internal mobility betrayed by carrington's and spurrer's observations led to the inference that the matter composing the sun was mainly or wholly gaseous 
this had already been suggested by father secchi a year earlier and by sir john herschel in april eighteen sixty four but it first obtained general currency through fay's more elaborate presentation a physical basis was afforded for the view by cagnard de la tour's experiments in eighteen twenty two proving that under conditions of great heat and pressure the vaporous state was compatible with a very considerable density the position was strengthened when andrews showed in eighteen sixty nine that above a fixed limit of temperature varying for different bodies true liquefaction is impossible even though the pressure be so tremendous as to retain the gas within the same space that enclosed the liquid the opinion that the mass of the sun is gaseous now commands a very general assent although the gaseity admitted is of such a nature as to afford the consistence rather of honey or pitch than of the aeriform fluids with which we are familiar on another important point the course of subsequent thought was powerfully influenced by Faye's conclusions in eighteen sixty five arago somewhat hastily inferred from experiments with the polariscope the wholly gaseous nature of the visible disk of the sun kirchhoff on the contrary believed erroneously as we now know that the brilliant continuous spectrum derived from it proved it to be a white-hot solid or liquid herschel and secchi indicated a cloud-like structure as that which would best harmonize the whole of the evidence at command the novelty introduced by fay consisted in regarding the photosphere no longer as a defined surface in the mathematical sense but as a limit to which in the general fluid mass ascending currents carry the physical or chemical phenomena of incandescence up rushing floods of mixed vapours with strong affinities say of calcium or sodium and oxygen at last attain a region cool enough to permit their combination a fine dust of solid or liquid compound particles of lime or soda for example there collects into the photospheric clouds and descending by its own weight in torrents of incandescent rain is dissociated by the fierce heat below and replaced by ascending and combining currents of similar constitution this first attempt to assign the part played in cosmical physics by chemical affinities was marked by the importation into the theory of the sun of the now familiar phrase dissociation it is indeed tolerably certain that no such combinations as those contemplated by fay occur at the photospheric level since the temperature there must be enormously higher than would be needed to reduce all metallic earths and oxides but molecular changes of some kind dependent perhaps in part upon electrical conditions in part upon the effects of radiation into space most likely replaced them the conjecture was emitted by dr johnstone stoney in eighteen sixty seven that the photospheric clouds are composed of carbon particles precipitated from their mounting vapour just where the temperature is lowered by expansion and radiation to the boiling point of that substance but this view though countenanced by angstrom and advocated by hastings of baltimore and other authorities is open to grave objections in Faye's theory sun-spots were regarded as simply breaks in the photospheric clouds where the rising currents had strength to tear them asunder it followed that they were regions of increased heat regions in fact where the temperature was too high to permit the occurrence of the precipitations to which the photosphere is due their obscurity was attributed as in dr brester's more recent theorie du soleil to deficiency of emissive power yet here the verdict of the spectroscope is adverse and irreversible after every deduction however has been made we still find that several ideas of permanent value were embodied in this comprehensive sketch of the solar constitution the principal of these were first that the sun is a mainly gaseous body secondly that its stores of heat are rendered available at the surface by means of vertical convection currents by the bodily transport that is to say of intensely hot matter upward and of comparatively cool matter downward thirdly that the photosphere is a surface of condensation forming the limit set by the cold of space to this circulating process and that a similar formation must attend at a certain stage the cooling of every cosmical body
to warren de la rue belongs the honour of having obtained the earliest results of substantial value in celestial photography what had been done previously was interesting in the way of promise but much could not be claimed for it as actual performance some pioneering experiments were made by dr j w draper of new york in eighteen forty resulting in the production of a few moon pictures one inch in diameter but slight encouragement was derived from them either to himself or others bond of cambridge u s however secured in eighteen fifty with the harvard fifteen inch refractor that daguerreotype of the moon with which the career of extra-terrestrial photography may be said to have formally opened it was shown in london at the great exhibition of eighteen fifty one and determined the direction of de la rue's efforts yet it did little more than prove the art to be a possible one warren de la rue was born in guernsey in eighteen fifteen and died in london april nineteen eighteen eighty nine educated at the ecole saint barbe in paris he made a large fortune as a paper manufacturer in england and thus amply and early provided the material supplies for his scientific campaign towards the end of eighteen fifty three he took some successful lunar photographs they were remarkable as the first examples of the application to astronomical light painting of the collodion process invented by archer in eighteen fifty one and also of the use of reflectors de la rue's was one of thirteen inches constructed by himself for that kind of work the absence of a driving apparatus was however very sensibly felt the difficulty of moving the instrument by hand so as accurately to follow the moon's apparent motion being such as to cause the discontinuance of the experiments until eighteen fifty seven when the want was supplied de la rue's new observatory built in that year at cranford was expressly dedicated to celestial photography and there he applied to the heavenly bodies the stereoscopic method of obtaining relief and turned his attention to the delicate business of photographing the sun a solar daguerreotype was taken at paris april two eighteen forty five by foucault and fizeau acting on a suggestion from arago but the attempt though far from being unsuccessful does not at that time seem to have been repeated its great difficulty consisted in the enormous light power of the object to be represented rendering an inconceivably short period of exposure indispensable under pain of getting completely burnt up plates in eighteen fifty seven de la rue was commissioned by the royal society to construct an instrument specially adapted to the purpose for the q observatory the resulting photoheliograph may be described as a small telescope of three and a half inches aperture and fifty focus with a plate holder at the eye end guarded in front by a spring slide the rapid movement of which across the field of view secured for the sensitive plate a virtually instantaneous exposure by its means the first solar light pictures of real value were taken and the autographic record of the solar condition recommended by sir john herschel was commenced and continued at kew during fourteen years eighteen fifty eight to seventy two the work of photographing the sun is now carried on in every quarter of the globe from mauritius to massachusetts and the days are few indeed on which the self-betrayal of the camera can be evaded by our chief luminary in the year eighteen eighty three the incorporation of indian with greenwich pictures afforded a record of the state of the solar surface on three hundred and forty days and three hundred and sixty four were similarly provided for in eighteen ninety seven and eighteen ninety nine the conclusions arrived at by photographic means at kew were communicated to the royal society in a series of papers drawn up jointly by de la rue balfour stewart and benjamin lowry in eighteen sixty five and subsequent years they influenced materially the progress of thought on the subject they were concerned with End of chapter two part one